Are we alone in the universe? This question has long been contemplated by humanity, igniting both the imagination of the wondrous possibilities of a shared universal community and the cosmic horror of the unknown. In a hope for some sort of resolution to this question, we have poured staggering amounts of effort into sending messages into outer space in a variety of forms. The Pioneer plaques, for instance, contain our locations in the universe and depictions of the human form. On the moon, we left an art museum. We have encoded who we are into a radio wave that has become this mass of pixels. However, my favorite message which we have sent into space are the golden records aboard Voyagers 1 and 2. In 1977, NASA had an excellent opportunity. Because of an incredibly precise alignment of the solar bodies, a spacecraft could be launched that could efficiently visit every outer rim planet in a single trip. Seeking to make the most of this amazing launch window, NASA launched the Voyager probes. While Voyager 1 only visited Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 2 flew by all of the solar system's gas giants. Both probes returned a slew of wondrous information. Voyager 1 found the first extraterrestrial volcanoes in our solar system on Jupiter's moon Io. Voyager 2 discovered that Uranus was the coldest planet in our solar system and both sent a plethora of gorgeous photographs. By nature of visiting our most distant planets, both probes were locked into trajectories that would carry both into interstellar space. On the off chance that aliens would discover these probes, a team of scientists, led by astronomer and author Carl Sagan, produced a memento from us to them. A memento which had the potential to illuminate who we are. A memento which took the form of a golden record, tucked away on each probe. The golden record, as the name suggests, were copper-plated discs etched with tokens of the planet Earth. Its cover contained pictograms that not only showed our artistic flair, but also contained information about us, encoded in a manner which we hope curious aliens could understand. One icon shows the position of our sun in relative distance to solar pulsars, should spacefarers want to visit. Another diagram represents what the aliens should see if they run the record correctly. On the record itself is inscribed this phrase, to the makers of music, all worlds, all times. The sounds of Earth. This text prominently and succinctly explains what the records are trying to be. A story of our pale blue dot, told by a great many things. Alongside the 116 images on the record that visually display what our lives are like, there are a plethora of sounds that do the same thing. The sound of a thunderous rainy day. the groaning music of whales. <laughs> Greetings in 55 languages. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Morse code. The liftoff of a Saturn V rocket. The cry of a baby. And more. These sounds were supposed to represent Earth in microcosm. And this is reflected in how the sounds are arranged in chronological order, to give an idea of the auditory history of our planet. 
Alongside this sonic history, we chose to highlight our music. Music is a touchstone of the human experience, found everywhere from our remotest tribes to the grandest opera halls. It's a social glue that helps us define and refine our identities and bring us together into a shared community. Through the team's curation of sounds, they hoped to convey a narrative. Somewhere in between Bach's Brandenburg Concierto, Peruvian wedding music, and the smooth jazz of Louis Armstrong, the curators hoped one could glean an idea of who we were. I want to emphasize the narrative here. When curating the record's contents, there was debate about how much the record should act as a historical document that reflected our fallibility, or an idealized depiction that focused on our potential. Recordings from the bloody skirmishes of World War I were considered, and the argument for their inclusion is succinctly summarized by team member Anne Druyan. If we showed ourselves as we really are, a species involved with struggle, wouldn't we at least be assured of the record's value as an accurate document? In the end, the war sounds were rejected in favor of a more favorable understanding of humanity that embraces multicultural celebration and champions the use of science for the betterment of all. Despite all of the philosophizing about this record's importance, the likelihood of it ever being found is minuscule at best, and no amount of hopeful thinking can really change that. However, even if the record is never found, its value won't be lost. Sure, the golden records were made for aliens, but on some level the records were for us too. There's something powerful about a public proclamation of one's self. To make such a statement, one needs to self-reflectively grapple with their very essence, striking at the very core of our beings. To me, this is part of what the Golden Record is, a thoughtful examination of what it means to be human, a journal entry in our cosmic diary. Personally, I have lost many hours pondering the queries raised by this record, thinking about how we might have changed and what has stayed the same. All of this fascinating intrigue was prompted by our desire to send music into space, but art extends beyond the auditory. Being someone who cares about games, it's only natural to ask, if we were to make a golden record of gaming, what games should we include? Games reflect our playful natures. They are the things we voluntarily give our time to for leisure, often for no immediately practical lesson aside from our own enjoyment. And at the same time, we take them incredibly seriously. Within game, one can find contemplations on morality, philosophy, and what it means to be human. Play is inseparably part of being human, and perhaps it should be shared with the stars, just like all those old songs. Naturally, this prompts the question, what games should we choose? There are two ways of responding to this question. Games are complicated pieces of art, and even many humans have a hard time coming to grips with how to play video games. For an alien with no knowledge of the culture that produced these games, the challenge of learning how to play would likely be much harder. The question of how to make games that would be playable by aliens is incredibly fascinating, but for the purposes of this essay, would be incredibly convoluted. Instead, I would like to focus on a related but still meaningful question. What games best represent humanity? Many songs on the original Golden Record featured lyrics, which 
the aliens would have an incredibly hard time understanding. However, we felt these songs were meaningful inclusions regardless, because they reflect the values and cultures of Earth. Personally, I think it's worth examining the Golden Record games under the lens of what they represent about us on a cosmic scale through the medium of play. Naturally, the task of pinning down what games best represent humanity for the cosmos is an astronomical task. Alone, I couldn't dream of adequately answering these questions. Frankly, even a cabal of Earth's greatest designers and academics couldn't adequately answer this question. Despite the enormity, I still find these questions meaningful for what they reveal about the people answering the question. Naturally, I wanted to expand the scope of my inquiries into this question, so I collected a bunch of essays from other gaming YouTubers asking them what games they want to send to space. Everyone on this planet will naturally have their own perspectives, so I wanted to get as many answers as possible. The following is their search, their answers to the unanswerable questions. Which video game should be preserved on our interstellar time capsule? The Golden Record. Hammurabi, also known as the Sumer Game, is a 1968 text-based land management game. In it, the player takes the role of King Hammurabi over the course of ten one-year rounds. Each round begins with a bit of a state of the union. The game highlights the current population, how much land is in the kingdom, how well last year's harvest went, how much of your grain you lost to rats, and how much grain you still possess in storage. The player is also notified of how much one acre of land costs in grain that same year. From this information, the player must decide how much grain to feed their people, how much grain to plant for the harvest, and how much land to buy or sell. Once these values are entered, the game calculates the results and reports to the player the new initial conditions for the next round. Some random things happen here and there. Basic population changes, fluctuations in the price of land, and the occasional plague, but that's basically it. If you mismanage your resources poorly enough, the people will overthrow your rule, triggering a lose state. Otherwise, at the end of the game, the player is judged based on how many people starved and how much land the city holds. Pretty simple. So, why send this game into space? Aliens, if they're out there, will likely be, well, alien. Even the most basic and fundamental elements of human life on Earth might require explicit demonstration. The simplicity of Hammurabi's mechanics could serve as a Humanity 101, so to speak, beginning with our reliance on agriculture for group survival, but that's just the start. The core gameplay loop of making decisions is an illustration of how humans and state policy for public good in a world beset by scarcity, setting the stage nicely for leading aliens gently into politics. The idea of lands that we own versus lands that we don't could be a nice primer for nationalism. Even the bartering of land for grain and their fluctuating prices could be a nice little segue into understanding bartering, capitalism, communism, and other forms of economic hierarchies. It might not be sexy, but teaching aliens about humanity is like a colossal task. Human beings are incredibly complex creatures with a long history. It would be easy to overwhelm potential students out there with the minutia of our crude characteristics. Just like how early learners of our own species are probably better suited with green eggs and ham before tackling Sinclair's The Jungle, I figured I'd throw in Hammurabi for our Golden Record compilation. Besides, the entire game could fit on, like, a floppy disk, leaving plenty of room for the more interesting games my esteemed colleagues are about to include. Electronica artist Moby once sang that we are all made of stars. Everything on Earth, including you, is made out of atomic materials that once existed in the heart of an enormous heavenly body. Hypothetically, if all the stars in the sky were destroyed in a drunken calamity, 
it only stands to reason that we could take that processed stardust and convert it back into suns. This is the thesis of Katamari Damacy, a video game where you must rebuild the skies by rolling and assimilating earthly commodities. In this game, you play as the Prince of all Cosmos, who is tasked to complete this Herculean effort by the man responsible for destroying the stars, his father. You use just two analog sticks to manipulate the prince and the titular Katamari lump. Once you've mastered panning, rotating, and dollying the Katamari, you're more than qualified to complete this task. Katamari Damasi is a pastiche of our post-war, consumer-driven society. This earth is made up of countless commodities, food, flora, toys, pets, people, vehicles, buildings, and even whole countries. Many of these things are littered out in the open, almost inviting you to use that Katamari to turn them into something more profound. All it takes is rolling the lump over an object smaller than itself, and it sticks to it, increasing the Katamari's sticky surface area. The bigger the Katamari grows, the bigger the stuff it can assimilate, no matter how much status it originally had. This adds to the game's already light tone, turning our entire world into a comedic sandbox that grows crazier as the Katamari grows larger. Through its simplified visual presentation and pop music soundtrack, Katamari Damacy creates an inviting play space fitting with its intuitive control scheme. It's a snapshot of Earth obsessed with commodities, though one that is ultimately at the comedic peril of the unfeeling King of All Cosmos. Hopefully, any extraterrestrial that plays this title might get a kick out of seeing all the things we turn Stardust into, before it is ultimately put right back into the cycle. When I think of what it means to be human, I think of those rich, complex emotions like love, fulfillment, belonging, fear, courage. And I think each of those emotions can be found in media. Media is here to make us feel. It's here to be shared, to entertain, to quicken the heart, expand the mind, fuel the soul, recontextualize our understanding, challenge our assumptions, and every now and then give us reason to crack a smile. Video games, specifically, as I'm sure you're well aware, are pretty damn good at putting you in the driver's seat of those complex human emotions, at least if you're playing the right ones. You can point to your Metal Gears, your journeys, the Midgars of the past, the high rolls of the future, the friends you've made that you'll never really meet, the mountains you've climbed, the giants you've overcome, and no doubt, the friends you've made that you have met. As you're watching this, you might be thinking of a game that's captured a part of who you are, or what you feel it means to be human. But when I think of what it is that makes our lives a meaningful part of the universe, I think of our impermanence, the idea that the impact we have on the world around us can be infinitely larger than our actual time here will ever be. That what we are is simply what we did with the time we had and the hand we were dealt. That our mark on reality is a function of what we do with the colors life has put in our palettes and how long we are given to paint that mark. And when I think of a game that illustrates that particular perspective on life, it's gotta be Tetris. That's right, Tetris is an allegory for making the most of life. That's the joke. Thesis, thesis. That's the, that is the thesis. In life, it's impossible to tell what tomorrow brings. I mean, sometimes you may have a good idea, but what if something goes wrong today? What if you make a mistake? What if things move faster than you expect? What if that friend you were counting on lets you down? What if one of your past regrets comes back to haunt you? On the surface, Tetris is a puzzle game, but I think when we are actually playing Tetris, when we are the ones racing to make room for that ever-falling new block, something primal is awakened in us. There is always going to be something new to deal with, a new ground ball to field, a new plot twist, a new thing to get excited about, another heartbreak, another try. And when playing Tetris, it's your job to find a way to make that work with however your matrix happens to look. Convenient or inconvenient, the new blocks come all the same, just like every single day comes all the same. And regardless of your score, how many lines you clear, or how long you happen to be playing a round of Tetris, are you satisfied with how you did? High scores are great, but not everyone has those kinds of ambitions. Maybe you just want to see how well you can do. Maybe you want to find a new way to play the game. Maybe you want to get fancy. Maybe you just want to enjoy yourself for as long as you can. Some will leave bigger scores than others, but I don't think it's about the score as much as it is that you played 
on purpose. I think the real question to ask in Tetris and in life is, are you proud of what you did? No matter how your game went, that's what matters. You're going to get a finite number of Tetraminos just as you're only going to get a finite number of sunrises. Are you happy with how you spent those blocks? Are you happy with how you spent your afternoons? You see, I figure a game of Tetris is like the game of life. You only really know two things. One, you are going to eventually lose and the game will be over. And two, despite the difficulty, you are in control of what happens until the last piece falls. And I find that thinking about the latter of those two statements gives me courage when I remember the former. So yeah, I would send the aliens Tetris, especially since it's an easy game to grasp. I'm sure they'll make the subtle connection between it and the morality of humanity from its mechanics. I get the sense that people in the scientific community are more or less modernists. People who believe that human progress is an uninterrupted vector towards progress and improvement. Space programs can only really happen in sufficiently developed countries where such a belief in progress is possible. People in the third world who may contest this narrative, who face disease, starvation, war, and colonialism, don't get to be the ones who get to launch their view of humanity into the stars. When asked to contribute to this video, I felt that this was a problem that needed to be confronted. Ideally, anything we present as a record for extraterrestrials can acknowledge both, the accomplishments and potential we have while not hiding our great mistakes and miseries. That's a difficult topic for any game to navigate, certainly, but fortunately, Riven embodies this dichotomy perfectly. The Mist series centers around exploring the ruins of an ancient people called the Dini. The games focus on teleporting to different worlds called Ages via linking books, with it revealed over the series that the special Dini language enables someone to write a description of a world, allowing the book to teleport them there. However, this raises some questions with fraught implications. Are the authors of these books actually creating these ages, or do the books merely link to an already existing age that matches their description? And more profoundly, what exactly happens when there's people who are already there? The Book of Atris was a tie-in novel released right before Riven came out, following the upbringing of Atris, the father at the end of Mist. Raised in a canyon by his grandmother, he is visited one day by Gen, who informs Atris that he is his father. Gen leads Atris back to the underground city of Dini and starts tutoring him in writing his own linking books. Gen believes that they are actually creating the ages they write, expecting to be treated by the indigenous people they find there like the deity he envisions himself as. Atris takes the opposite view, believing there to be infinite ages with slight variations and that any book could find a matching age. The book ends with this dispute coming to a head, with Atris trapping Gen in one of his father's own ages, one Atris dubs Riven. Riven the game, then, starts with Atris imploring the player to rescue his wife Catherine, who has become trapped on Riven alongside Gen. A couple of times in the game, the player is able to read his diaries and get a clear view of what he really thinks of the natives. He describes them as savages who are prone to violence and forces them to work on machines of his design. Eventually, the player comes face to face with Gen, who expresses a desire to rebuild the civilization he grew up in by conquering age after age, a quite literal imperialist. The world that Gen has subjugated, though, feels so fully realized. As an example, one of the big areas in the game is a village of the native people. Walking around, the player finds a building with rows of chairs facing towards a desk, the slow realization that this is a schoolhouse dawning. There's a small wooden contraption on a table there. Clicking it, a roulette spins, and one of the wooden hanging people on it inches down a certain number of notches towards some wooden fish below, ones that resemble some creatures the player passed earlier. After clicking it a few times, it hits you. 
This is a toy meant to teach children numbers, the symbols of which the player actually needs to learn in order to solve a puzzle in the game. This toy, not just in its purpose but in its ornamentation, is an artifact that feels like it came out of a very real culture. I could also talk about the excellent puzzles. Unlike Myst's largely bespoke ages, advancing through Riven requires the player to explore and piece together information scattered across all of the islands, the land feeling like one giant mechanism. I could also discuss its technical achievements, pushing Myst's pre-rendered screens even further and more fluidly incorporating live-action footage. The, the damn thing came out on five CD-ROMs. Providing a discussion on some of our darker aspects, packaged in one of our most marvelous technical achievements, Riven doesn't necessarily show the best of humanity, but I do think it is the best at showing humanity. Story of Your Life is a short novella written by Ted Chang, in which an interstellar lifeform discovers humanity and visits Earth. There has been more than enough stories written of alien invasions which ask the question, how do humans survive an encounter with aliens? But Story of Your Life concerns itself with a much more logistical question. How do we communicate with our alien visitors? You may recognise this story as the basis of the film Arrival, which does a fantastic job of translating the book for the screen and interpreting the linguistic nuances of the written alien language. When prompted to select a video game to be sent out into the universe in the hopes that an alien lifeform would discover it and learn of humanity, inevitably the question of communication comes up. Will the aliens be able to understand what the game is trying to convey? We have been specifically asked to ignore that question, but in the spirit of miscommunication, I'm not going to. I'll let others pick the games which show a quintessential image of the lived human experience. I want to send a message to the aliens, and I'm going to do that through The Last Guardian. This is a game about a boy who discovers a creature named Trico. The boy and Trico are two wildly different animals. The boy is a human, small and weak, but smart and resourceful. Trico is a cat griffin thing. It is much bigger, stronger, and agile than the human. It has wings, presumably for flight, and it shoots lightning out of its tail for some reason. The boy and Trico must work together to overcome the problems they face and achieve a common goal, and they have to do so without the ability to speak with each other. Trico doesn't understand the language the boy is using, nor does the boy understand Trico's screeches. Their ability to work together is also impaired by the initial lack of trust between them, and Trico's stubborn tendency to just not do what it's told. It can be frustrating at times trying to get the pair to cooperate. That's not to say that Trico is poorly designed. Quite the opposite. Trico is an absolute triumph of artificial intelligence, masterfully created to act just as a real animal would. It's this level of detail and fidelity in Trico's design which enables the gameplay of The Last Guardian to form the language of communication between the two. Playing as the boy, you are limited in your capabilities, and rely on Trico to defend you from enemies, leap over large obstacles, and the such. But at the same time, Trico is relying on you to calm it down after combat, remove lodged weapons from its body, and break the stained glass that it is frightened of. It's through playing as the boy, relying on Trico and in return helping Trico, that you bond with the creature and build a trust with it. You don't need words to understand the partnership between the two, because you are actively participating in the relationship. This is the message that I'd like to send to our alien friends. That we are friends, and that we want to work together and help each other, despite our differences and our inability to effectively communicate with one another. It may not be easy to grasp, and we will get frustrated along the way, but we are committed to cooperating. Perhaps it's a naive message to send, optimistic at best, and downright deceptive at worst. 
but it's my hope that by including The Last Guardian, it can set a precedent for future communication with extraterrestrial intelligent life, and begin our relationship with our universal neighbours with the best of intentions. If we're talking about putting a game down on a modern golden record, you know, slipping an interactive experience into an open letter meant to communicate something fundamental about us, about what it is to be human. Well then, <clears throat> to whom it may concern, I present to you, we fit. I think if we want to share as much information about who we are, what we like, and how we operate in a single clamshell, then we fit is our best bet. Not only does it contain an indirect anatomy schematic, but I think it's a good minimum step to gauging whether or not an alien species could ever possibly understand us. I think that anyone or anything that can pick up We Fit and experience it and understand it would be taking its first step relating to humanity in doing so. Sure, we could send them something a little bit more abstract than its depiction of a human experience. Something like Dark Souls with which they could experience the feeling of triumph over seemingly insurmountable challenges. But have you ever tried to lose weight and keep it off? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of tough games out there, but none as hard as that. Furthermore, I want the aliens to understand something about our well-being and our desires, and how those two aren't always aligned. I want them to know that we're fallible beings who can unfortunately waste if we don't take care of ourselves in many different ways. <sighs> I'm gonna have a heart attack. I want them to also perceive that the existence of a gamified experience like this is proof that we have difficulty with that. Humans are often lazy, we need to sometimes trick ourselves into doing things that are good for us. But then I also would hope the aliens to not look past the fact that the vessel containing this message about our imperfection is no mere bottle adrift, but is a spacecraft which must have taken monumental effort to assemble and send so far out of our system. Look, what I'm saying is that anyone who's got hips to hula hoop with has got to be pretty chill. Oh, oh my god! Am I done? Look at this spaghetti! That's not even the full barks! Ah! It might not be noticeable at first glance. The abstract visuals and bright colors may distract you from the fact. There are no photorealistic graphics, no words spoken. And yet, Hohoka manages to be one of the most real and human experiences you can find on modern hardware. By framing the silent narrative around the old and popular children's game Hide and Seek, it captures some of the most fundamental aspects of our very beings, like playfulness, creativity, and curiosity. In Hohokam, the simple act of just moving is a joyful dance, a ride as wild as it is serene. You explore the wondrously whimsical world without direction. The only thing that really guides you is your own desire to see more mischievously prodding at it as if it was an intricate toy. It's seeing the world through a shell-like perspective, a hopeful one of non-violence and absolute unfiltered freedom. And it's one we think can be universally understood in its abstract simplicity, something that says a lot about us through creative play alone. When I think of what should be on the golden record, my mind wanders to the many games that made me fall in love with the medium. Discussing and playing games is my greatest passion, so I thought hard about what title would best capture that joy, and the essence of why we love gaming, as well as the addition of a little gaming history to help give context to our alien friends. With all that in mind, I chose Astro's Playroom. Assuming we can even get our hands on a spare PS5, the game comes with the console free of charge. Astro's Playroom is basically a showcase of the new hardware through the gameplay of a fun 3D platformer, and as of writing this, it's one of the most technically impressive games that exist, especially thanks to the PS5 controller's capabilities. But what Astro's Playroom does best is encapsulate the history of PlayStation consoles. 
I didn't grow up with PlayStation games, and so I've been catching up on a lot in the past few years. Nostalgia is a tricky thing, as while I was playing these titles, I still felt it just from the graphics and characters plastered on posters and advertisements back in the day. I remember them from the demos I used to play in game stores, or from the game covers I picked up and studied. History is intertwined with nostalgia, and that's not exclusive to those who played these games back in the day. Astro's Playroom does a fine job of allowing you to collect models of PlayStation hardware, and ends each level with the satisfying sounds of those startup screens from older consoles, which never fail to give me chills. These moments feel so special and commemorative, not just as a congratulations for completing the level, but also the end of an era. The stages are filled with references to iconic characters from other PlayStation games, so depending on what games the aliens might play on the Golden Record before this, they might recognise some characters too. Astro's Playroom is a perfect celebration of the history of PlayStation, but it's also a very good game in its own right, with its level design and polish. The haptic feedback from the PS5 controller brings the textures and movements in this virtual world to life, and playing this next-gen game made me feel that magic of gaming all over again. This virtual museum of a game shows us just how far gaming has come, and how much further it has yet to go. Astro's Playroom isn't just a game, it's a history book. What game would I send into space to tell whatever other intelligence may exist out there about us? I had so many answers to this question. What united so many of my considerations was how, on some level, they all seemed to explore a level of culture, or the concepts of interaction. Combat, speech, the things that scare us, and while these things are important, I kind of had to wonder if there was some common ground that could be found. As such, The Witness kept echoing in my mind and ultimately became my choice. It has always stood out to me as a game that is more interested in the elemental building blocks of awareness and understanding, getting at what it is that defines us and our relationship with whatever world we find ourselves in. It's a very human game, starting us fresh and uninformed in a strange place, and just through the act of presenting a capability, the ability to draw lines on things combined with the asynchronous design of the panels we find, it isn't long before just about anybody will be off running into the weeds of this game, going exactly as far as their drive will take them. At no point does the game assume we are part of the human world. It doesn't require us to read or even know how to speak. It doesn't need us to know how to type or drive or cook, build, craft. It doesn't need you to know what objects are for or what they do. The only thing you need to know going into this game is that three-dimensional space can be moved through in order to interact with things that are in it, and how great is it that the witness takes as much advantage of all of the dimensions it works in as it possibly can, conveying an understanding of perspective and meaning through arrangement. It's a game that boasts countless details to notice and engages so many different ways of stimulating awareness. The only thing that the game absolutely requires from us directly is to exercise our ability and willingness to learn something new by observing what is true. Seeing what works and what doesn't, arguably the most human part of us. But maybe a good start would be to recognize within yourself the ability to understand anything, because that ability is there, as long as it's explained clearly enough. That's what gives me goosebumps in this context. Putting this game on the record for me is the idea that not only are there other life forms out there, but that we and our new friends in the galaxy could stand in the same conceptual space wondering what these symbols are trying to tell us, and then eventually reach the same conclusion, with no speech, translation, or traveling possibly millions of light years to explain needed. Or maybe they will learn of frustration and perceive personal limits. Maybe it will inspire them to overcome and try again. Maybe they will, like us, fracture and take different things away from the game, learning from each other as much as from themselves. That common ground is the kind of thing the witness is built on, and perhaps in this case, it can be a chance to extend these basic statements about humanity beyond humanity itself.
Hello, it's me, Dark Fry, the most what? qualified pink iridescent blob to determine which video game to include on a golden record of gaming. It's a tough question. As soon as Chariot asked me, I scoured my entire library and every game I know, looking for the best shred of humanity I could find like I was Pinocchio wanting to be a real boy, if he could only do it through video games. Game Builder's Garage is a very recent release from Nintendo that can be roughly described as a simplified, visual-based game engine. <coughs> it is very much geared towards young kids, making its systems very simple, intuitive, and explains their functions and purpose extensively. The tutorial takes multiple hours, walks you through the creation of multiple small games step by step in excruciating detail. I've seen a lot of people criticize it for this reason, and I get it. Most people are averse to heavy tutorials. Remember, however, that this thing is a freaking game engine, and one for kids at that. It starts showing you the many possibilities this thing can produce. It has you make Tag, a space shooter, a 3D puzzle game, a 3D platformer, the whole works. If it gets iterated upon and expanded, I think this can be such an important tool for teaching kids game making and game design. This software will create future game designers, and I think that's just beautiful. I can't overstate how important something like this can be for the industry if done well and maintained well. But why am I talking about Game Builder's Garage now of all times? Am I seriously suggesting that game design is the thing that makes us human? Yes. Hear me out. We all know that creating a game is a lot of work, right? It's one of the main reasons the Are Video Games Art debate was so silly, because pretty much every single discipline that is considered art goes into making a game, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you make the irrevocable decision of trying to become a game dev, and learn even more of what goes on behind the scenes of every game, you will start to seriously wonder how any game gets finished and shipped ever. It is hard, exhausting, grueling work, but there are so many driving forces behind the people who make them. So much motivation and passion, and at the heart of that passion, is a burning desire to make an experience that will be shared and enjoyed by other people. Strip down all the curtains, and behind most games you will find a yearning to create and share. I cannot think of something more human than that. There's a strong argument to be made that self-expression and creating art is what makes humans human. Art has been a thing as long as humans have. Of course, Game Builder's Garage isn't the first or only game to be about creating art. There are games about drawing and illustrating that will give you a greater understanding of visual art. Games like Minecraft let you unleash your creativity, and other games even incorporate creating art into their mechanics and themes. Mario Maker comes the closest, since it lets players create their own Mario levels, to see the process behind creating the stages of some of the most iconic games ever, and teaching many young folks the basics of level design. Game Builder's Garage goes a step further than that, though. I believe it is currently the most accessible and thorough look at the inner workings of a game for any young kids that potentially want to get into game design, and a surprisingly robust tool for people who already are making games or want to. I know for a fact that I'll be trying out some ideas I have had for a while in this, to see if they work and have fun making something fun. At the time of writing this, it's only been out a few days, and people have already made incredible things with it. Look at this Sonic game, what?! I'm not saying that it's perfect, by the way. Heck, it's arguably not even that great, and it's criminal how needlessly difficult sharing and finding games is. Dreams is a much more robust tool for creating and has a much better sharing system. But Game Builder's Garage is much more accessible and a better learning tool. With Dreams, game designers create. Game Builder's Garage will create game designers. Just the fact that it exists is super exciting to me. If they keep updating and iterating on this idea, we're going to have something truly special here. A game about learning creating and sharing games. I can't think of something more fitting to put on a golden record.
Besides the sound and music of Earth, the creators of the Voyager Golden Record chose 116 images to encode onto the discs as a visual record of humanity. These images depict a world with no weapons, no military. There's no sign of war, sickness, famine, or natural disaster. An intelligence learning of our species through this record would perceive no unhappiness, no suffering, no death. This wasn't an oversight. The sciences, the arts, the natural world, human beings of different ages, professions, and ethnicities, these were the facets of life on Earth the creators of the Golden Record wanted to represent. They took a photo of our good side. So on the matter of what to etch into gaming's Golden Record, the pivotal question is this. Which parts of human nature should we broadcast and which should we hide? Creation or destruction? Optimism or pessimism? The open hand or the closed fist? Because these are all human characteristics, coexisting, inseparable. Any choice we make will favor some over others. And I don't need to point out that there are more games that lean on violence than on pacifism, on conflict rather than understanding. How could we send any of these games out into the universe? What would it say about us if we did? Life is Strange is the story of Max Caulfield, an 18-year-old art student living in a small, waning town on the Oregon coast. Max discovers by accident that she has the ability to rewind time, a mental undo button that can change cause and effect. Teaming up with her estranged childhood friend Chloe Price, they set out to solve the dark mysteries hanging over Arcadia Bay. The story contains supernatural elements, high-stakes decisions, and melodrama. But it's also small, intimate, grounded in empathy, uncertainty, and self-doubt. With a rare emotional authenticity, it portrays the highs and lows of human life, both the pivotal moments that define us and the subtler experiences. Trying to fit in at school, struggling to pay bills, growing up and losing touch with your friends. The ways that life can be scary, confusing, traumatic, strange. It deals with heavy and emotional themes. Fear, despair, loss, making mistakes and having to live with the consequences. Trying your best to do the right thing when there's no one there to tell you what that's supposed to be. It's about navigating social situations, building connections with other people, trying to understand them in all their contradictions. And it's about the quiet moments in the chaos. Lying on a mattress, sitting on a swing, stretching out a moment to an eternity. The diversity of life's experience is infinite. It can no more be represented by one game than it can by a hundred. But Life is Strange gets closer than almost anything else I've played. It shows a different side of humanity to most games. It celebrates empathy, vulnerability, and fallibility, and shows that they aren't weaknesses. It makes the case that people are worth saving, even the ones who at first glance might not seem that way. At a time when the future of humankind is subject to forces we've set in motion, but that we can't control, perhaps that's true of us as a species as well. And if the message we send should outlast us, which is, after all, the point of the Golden Record, then at least there'll be a memory of what life felt like. The pressure of the challenges we face, but also the relief of quiet moments and the comfort we find in human connection. How even when we feel powerless, we remain hopeful. We're still here, in all our complexity, just trying to make sense of the world. There's a lot of games I could pick from, but I suffer from the over-choice phenomena frequently, so I figured it was best to just go with the first game that felt right. Submitted for the approval of the Golden Record Society, I picked Valhalla Cyberpunk Bartender Action as my Golden Record game. This is for a couple of reasons. First off, the aliens need to learn that we're fast and loose with language. 
We'll use integers in place of letters just to fit an aesthetic. Second off, this is a game that's all about drinking alcohol and chatting with your fellow man. Humans have been sitting around, getting drunk, and talking to each other for about as long as we've had thumbs, so why not show them that with a game? I've been playing games my whole life, and while I won't pretend to know everything there is to know about the medium, Valhalla is the only one I know of that has drinking and talking to people as its focal point. There aren't many auxiliary mechanics outside of the drink mixing, so it's pretty straightforward. Maybe that would hammer the point home about how important talking to people can be. We're social creatures, and maybe when the aliens land we can take them out to a pub or something. Or down a few white claws in their mothership if they're kinda shy. I'd also like to see the perspective of someone or something playing this game without having any prior experience with video games as we know them. I can only speak from an anecdotal perspective, but for a long time it felt like the visual novel was a genre of game as niche as they come. To this day, people will make impassioned arguments over whether or not they should even be considered games, citing all sorts of definitions that happen to exclude them from the conversation. This passionate vitriol has certainly simmered with time, but that said, I wonder if this debate would even exist with the aliens. If they got an absolutely tiny sample size of video games humans have made and one of them was Valhalla, I believe that they would just take the fact for granted that both it and other visual novels are indeed games. Super Mario Bros. is a game where you run and jump, Tetris is a game where you stack and eliminate blocks, and Valhalla is a game where you mix drinks and change lives. Or to be less cheeky about it, serve people drinks and listen to their problems. So I picked Valhalla partly to satiate a curiosity I have over the genre of visual novels and its position in the greater conversation of video games. That begs the question of why pick this game instead of literally any other visual novel. Two reasons. One embarrassing, one not. Here's the embarrassing one first. I've not played many games that are strictly visual novels. Phoenix Wright and even Sakura Wars probably wouldn't work for my experiment. I'm sorry if you expected me to be some sort of moderator on the visual novel database, but I couldn't even get the patch for Famicom Detective Club to work on my PC. The second reason is because it's one of the only modern visual novels that plays it almost completely straight with regards to its genre. A lot of popular visual novels, from the West anyway, put some sort of twist on the genre or expect the player to have at least cursory knowledge on known quantities in visual novels, which they then use to establish some sort of greater meta-narrative that I don't think the aliens are quite ready for. But that's all set dressing compared to my true reason for why I picked this. If the aliens play Valhalla, there's a non-zero chance that they'll also get to that part of the game where a couple of cosplayers appear dressed up as characters from Y2K. Then, when they land, one of their questions might be something like, I really love that Valhalla game, but they mentioned that there was this other game called Yik. Where do I find that one? That would be the dream. Yeah, Tetris. This was a pretty easy one to pick. It's not because it's a more abstract game because we can assume in this case that the aliens all understand what the games are, but Tetris does have universal appeal, at least among human beings. I mean, going back through its history, companies are basically fist fighting for the right to distribute it. Nowadays, there are all kinds of ways to access the game, many of them for free. Something in our brains is satisfied by seeing a pattern filled up and then just wiped away. It is interesting that it was invented by a Soviet scientist during the Cold War. Back then, people were very consciously thinking about how everything they had built might be wiped away soon. Here in America, Soviets were the enemy and anything they made could be seen as propaganda. Even today, some grocery products like Kefir might say they're from the Ural Mountains instead of, you know, Russia. When Nintendo was shopping Tetris around, that was an exception. From Russia with fun. Everyone who played it on a computer was already hooked, so there was no worry about it. The game was so good and addictive that it didn't matter. Tetris could transcend country borders, but could it transcend planets? I don't know, and I don't know what it would say about us. Maybe minds that develop our kind of intelligence do so in a similar way, and aliens could play and enjoy Tetris because they get it like we do. Perhaps their thinking is so different that they can't understand the appeal, and yeah, this is a uniquely human game. Or they're beyond it. Most adults don't want to play with games for toddlers, even though they might get it, like matching an animal sound with a picture of the animal, because their brains have developed and they just don't find that engaging. Tetris could be the same way, where they understand why we spend time with it, but it's not for them. It's too simple. 
It doesn't have an incredible plot or any story at all, really. It doesn't have amazing graphics or... I don't know, anything that most games get praised for now. But it's rare to see an all-time greatest game list that doesn't have Tetris on it. It's near 40 now, but still played by people all over the world. Whether it could be enjoyed beyond that says a lot about how intelligence works, or, at least, it says how we work. Games are social objects, touchstones which people congregate around to play together. The most played games, both virtual and physical, tend to be competitive in nature. Attempting to best another person is a thrill single player games often struggle to catch up with. So if I were to place a video game on a rocket to the cosmos, I would select a multiplayer game, something that gets at the heart of why most people on Earth play games in the first place. Which multiplayer game is difficult? My goal is to provide for this otherworldly being a sense of the intense emotions that swell in us as we play these games, but some games don't have the emotional depth, and some are simply too complex for that to be the primary feeling coming through. So let's go with something simple, but not too simple. Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 is an immensely important game from a cultural standpoint. Not only is it the progenitor of the entire fighting game genre, the savior of arcade gaming in the early 90s, or one of the first games to generate a sustained competitive community, but it also inspired an entire generation of designers to think of video games as social. John Romero says it was a huge influence on the inclusion and implementation of the deathmatch mode in Doom. But we're not here to read off Street Fighter 2's accolades. Instead, I want to talk about the experience of playing Street Fighter 2 assuming you've never played an Earthian video game before. First, you find yourself on a character select screen with a dozen different avatars to choose from. While there's a lot to be improved upon in terms of Street Fighter's representation of humanity, it does at least attempt to give the player a worldly perspective. There are characters and stages from all over the planet representing different cultures and a map that gives the player a geographic view of Earth. Browsing these stages and personalities gives the player a sense of the enormity of our cultures and the differences between us depending on where we are from and what we value. That feeling of difference is blown wide open when one actually plays a round of the game. Each character controls differently, has weaknesses and strengths based on a variety of factors. While performing a single move such as a light punch is straightforward and simple, perhaps even boring, it is the relationship between the two players that adds complexity and intrigue to the fighting game. It isn't whether or not you can throw a light punch, it's whether you can land one on an opponent. If you can react or predict what they are going to do next and counter it with your own move while they are attempting to do the same thing to you. To fight someone in Street Fighter 2 is to share a language with them. While that language's purpose is to beat the other player into submission, for those brief moments of competition, these players are tangoing on the dance floor of their arcade sticks, weaving in and out of each other in a series of coordinated strikes and blocks, attempting to outdo each other on the battlefield. Fighting games are ripe with emotion, and this dance is overflowing with it. The disappointment and defeat, the high of victory, the sweaty hands straining to pull off a combo, these are what make competition great. The shortness of Street Fighter 2's rounds assures that these emotional states will be experienced by the player. Once someone has those feelings swelling within them, I hope they'll better understand why we give so much of ourselves to such games. Because it is these emotions, these tensions, that make us feel fully alive, fully human. Such fullness is far more attainable with someone else, because we are social beings. And everything we create and destroy are social objects. Besides that, it can't hurt to make aliens think we can shoot fireballs out of our hands, can it? My first thought was EDF. I figured this would show the aliens that we aren't messing around. But really, when I think about humanity as a whole, we kind of are. And I don't want to be held accountable for gaslighting whatever winds up visiting us. I'm sure our leaders will do a fine enough job of that without my help. So my golden record game is instead Sonic CD, an odd entry in the classic Sonic lineup. Gorgeous game. Terrible gameplay. But I think it has some merits besides. For one, we don't know how the aliens are going to perceive color, so let's just go with all of them. The game is beautiful and vibrant, so we may be worth keeping around on artistic merit alone. And if they can't see, they'll at least hear one of two gorgeous soundtracks. Though likely only the first stage, and that's if they can make it through the menu without eyes. 
The stage design is atrocious. It's all bouncers and annoying spike placement. So they'll at the least get the idea that we're a stubborn lot and they'll hopefully respect us for it. A lot of people find this game really enjoyable, so they'll get the idea that we bash our heads into walls for pleasure and you don't mess with that. What I think is the most important element is that it tells its story entirely without words. And this isn't just Metal Sonic kidnaps Amy, go save her. No one cares about that. Not even Sonic cares about that. The classic games had a lot of environmentalist imagery and theming. Sonic comes from nature to protect nature against the industrious Dr. Robotnik. CD ties that conflict into actual gameplay with time travel. If we go into the future, well, it's a bit rough. But this gets an interesting spin, because we can go back to the past to destroy Eggman's devices, cutting out his influence. Returning to the future from there doesn't create Kaczynski's dream world, but instead shows the natural world operating in harmony with automation to create a miraculous synthesis. Environmentalist tales often demonize or outright reject human development, with our influence a plague on the natural world. I find this a bit naive and a dodging of any real solution, and I'm sure any spacefaring aliens will turn their, I don't know, noses up at that much. Sonic CD says that we can't halt progress, but what we can do is turn it in the right direction. Use it in tandem with the world around us to create paradise. That it's our responsibility to be responsible with what we've made. Let the aliens know that we understand our actions have consequences. They might even forgive the bumper spam and horrible enemy placement. Thumbs up for humanity, even if the only human in the game is a bit of a dick. According to scientists, mathematics and physics are a universal method of communication, because math and physics remain consistent everywhere in the galaxy. This is why scientists chose to use the transition of hydrogen atoms between parallel and anti-parallel spins as a basis of all measurements on the golden record. In addition to these two communicative constants, I feel there is another domain which holds the potential to convey information without reliance on a specific cultural understanding, interactivity. It's surprising how much can be intuited by a system merely by interacting with it. In particular, one thing I feel interactivity excels at communicating is relationships between elements. Merely through interactivity, one can gleam that these rainworld berries can be eaten or that these lizards are incredibly deadly. Interactivity can tell us a lot about relationships between objects in a system, but what can it tell us about ourselves? Humans are rarely isolationist creatures. We form relationships of all sorts with those around us, and some games seek to explore the nature of these relationships through interactivity. Florence is one such game, and its exploration of human relationship is, I feel, worthy of the golden record. Florence tells the story of the titular Florence, and her relationship with Krish, the cellist. Over the course of the game, the pair meet, grow closer, and eventually fall apart. What I find fascinating about this game is how it makes this story interactive, and colors the player's actions with relatable and nuanced meaning. When the pair first start dating, the game puts the player in Florence's shoes by having them complete these conversation puzzles. At first, these puzzles have tons of pieces, and the player awkwardly and slowly fits them together, but as time goes on and the two become closer, the number of pieces gets smaller. It becomes natural and effortless to construct your speech bubble, and after a certain point one barely needs to put in any effort at all. What's brilliant about this is how Florence has taken the experience of awkwardly finding one's words on a first date and the gradual comfort of conversation, and translated that into an interactive experience that is universally understandable. Mechanically speaking, this speech puzzle communicates that the repetition of this action makes it easier in the future, and that meaning doesn't rely on an understanding of human culture, and thus it can be deciphered anywhere in the universe. Florence is filled with little moments that communicate the spectrum of feelings felt in a relationship in a way that utilizes interactivity. 
the monotony of everyday life, the distancing effects of time, the dizziness of a bike crash, the chaos of a fight, the pain of letting go. All of this is captured through the language of interactivity, encoded with the nature of play. Humans do a lot of things, but we also feel a lot of things. Having a game less defined by our actions and more focused on how we process our emotions is important because emotions are an incredibly large part of who we are. I like to think that while Florence is incredibly human, aliens could relate to it. Perhaps they too struggle to find their words on their first dates in whatever their coffeehouse equivalents are. Perhaps aliens know the feeling of growing distant from someone they care about. Love is a universal feeling, at least I hope it is. By sharing this story of love, both found and lost, perhaps we can establish that maybe humans and aliens aren't so different after all. Interaction is how meaning in a system is produced, and Florence puts that to great use, shining a light on these complicated human feelings. It is kind of hard for our puny dumbo head brains to properly conceptualize fundamental differences between ourselves and another potential spacefaring species. Their arms may be four times as long, their eyes on their hands. They may hear in different frequencies, registering through a different nervous system. They could communicate entirely differently than us, telepathically, rhythmically. Who can say that the hypothetical founders of the Golden Record can even perceive it in any meaningful way? Perceive. Perception. It's the foundation of my thought process toward finding what is uniquely homo sapien about us. As far as I can tell, from my biased point of view, theorizing about how differently things can be perceived is honestly interesting as all get out. Sight, sound, touch, feeling, smell. I would be most surprised and shocked if another species perceived those things in the same way we do. There's just no way. But by far the most interesting to contemplate, though, is time. The perception of time, to me, is the greatest and most compelling unknown of another celestial traveling species. Our understanding and relative relationship to time might just be the single most unique experience we have to another species. The entirety of our lives, from birth to death, through school and retirement and love and loss, could be a veritable weekend as compared to the lifespans of another. One hundred years could be an eternity or a blip, a coming of age or a lifelong struggle. And this is all relative to our experience, too, and assuming that time is even understood or seen in the same way. I had to pick a game about time. My first thought was video game analysis darling The Outer Wilds, a title about, well, space first off, but also a title that emphasizes a set specific amount of time and demands that time be used mechanically. I also looked at other time-based games like Ocarina of Time, Braid, or Dead Rising, games that use time as a narrative or mechanical element, highlighting how important specific amounts of time are to our daily lives. I felt like all of these games harness time specifically, but not always in how they are intricately tied to our daily human lives. It's here then that I was stuck with inspiration, a game that highlights that existential role time plays in our lives, about how we must make the most of our lives while we are here, about how dead-end jobs can be soul-crushing when considered amongst the shortness of our existence. But more importantly, it's about how relationships and humans interact over time. It's here that I knew I had to take our alien friends to Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley may not hit on some level of photorealism that would represent humanity in our truest form, but I do think it is important we strive for portraying elements of our experience that are independent of our mortal shells. Stardew hits on a number of distinctly human experiences that I want to highlight here. First is obviously time, and the way that time encourages cycles. Spring turns to summer, summer to autumn, autumn brings winter, and then, like that, in the same amount of time, every time, we arrive back at spring. It highlights the repetition of our lives, from seasonal crops to annual get-togethers. The folks of Pelican Town encourage community and relationships over time in a way that other games just don't systemize. 
Seeing strangers turn to friends and friends turn to lovers over the course of consistently timed days and seasons tells the player that time is a key component of interconnectedness in our communities. Even past the abstract sort of musings on the importance of time to the human experience, Stardew is uniquely positioned to provide a neat little survey of the flora and fauna found on Earth. Information can be gleaned by our star-sharing siblings about our agricultural habits, our diet, our cultures and customs, and our furry friends. Gazorpelbop and his friends can be confused about why we eat some animals but keep others in our bedrooms for comfort, about how a seed can turn into a plant that turns into a drink that turns into a belligerent social get-together. When I think of Stardew Valley, I think of cycles. I think of the Moonlight Jelly Festival every year, or the Easter Egg Hunt. When I think of myself, of my experience as a human being, I tend to think of the same things Stardew Valley most values. My life in macro, what I spent my time doing, my relationships, my family and interests, and the way those things manifest into my favorite foods or music or gifts. When they were creating the Golden Record, they contemplated the inclusion of sounds of war and death. Sure, it is reflective of our true experiences here, but I think I am looking at this hypothetical golden record of games in the same way the real one was crafted, an aspirational view into what we can be, what we often are, meaningful creatures who have meaningful interactions over time. Ultimately, all types of knowledge simply means self-knowledge. The great philosopher, equal to heaven, Bruce Lee. When I try to think of a game that can capture the human experience, I automatically think of how to capture the essence of philosophy. Not meaning a specific historical account of one culture's field of study, but the study of ideas, thought, and being as a whole. Philosophy is the one field whose subject matter, whose data set, is everything. Religion, psychology, language, art, math, physics, science, you name it. For every topic, there is a philosophy of how we understand that topic. Philosophy divides and categorizes every kind of thought into neat and tidy taxonomies, only to cross the branches and evaluate each idea as an intersection with every other idea. I am autistic, which I say because my brain is biologically different from other brains. It is an inherent quality to who I am, but not so different that I am any more or less valuable than any other individual. Equity means being different and equal. I have autism, which I say because while my brain is biologically different, I am not defined merely by the circumstance of my birth, but equally defined by every unique part that makes every person born a unique, whole person. I am unique in a certain way but not more unique than all people who are unique among a class of similarities. I am unique among a class. I have a part in the whole, an incidental instance sharing in the greater mass of humanity. I am verbal, very verbal. Many would say annoyingly verbal. And while I may have been born verbal, this doesn't mean I had the intuition of social knowledge that people who are not unique like me possess. But learning philosophy gave me a new language. A language that is dense, but lets me shoot straight and honest. It gave me the tools to become verbal and social. The tools to understand and even be understood. Isn't that what everyone wants? I think humanity is defined by trying to understand itself. In trying to understand the universe, we are simply finding points of similarity or contrast to better define ourselves. If we were to look at the sum total of all humanity at once, we would see a giant organic mass yelling at itself, this is what I am, please love me. Art is an obsession of replicating ourselves, to ourselves, to understand ourselves. And that is why the Talos Principle is my golden record game. Through a canonically overt Judeo-Christian allegory, the actions of an artificial intelligence, you, Solving puzzles and climbing a tower creates a dynamic that instills foundational values, faith and essentialism, from the perspectives of multiple ancient cultures into your play. These are the guiding principles that Elohim wants you to experience. All the while you have the option, entirely optional, to engage with a complex simulation of philosophical dialogue that instills into your play transgressive values, 
skepticism, and existentialism from the perspective of other AI which have gone through or are going through the game as well. These are the guiding principles that the MLA wants you to experience. Assigning meaning, denying that meaning, and discussing that meaning through introspective personal questions, goodwill conversations, and impassioned bad faith debates. Is that not the human experience? To be entirely reductionist, the Talos Principle is a game about a robot trying to prove that it is human and escape the Matrix. You, a human player, are that robot, trying to prove your humanity to other robots. The gameplay and the puzzles are nothing innovative, but the depth of meaning being assigned to these mundane tasks is a well of fathoms. When I think about what to put on the golden record, I don't want to put something that tells the universe how important we think we are. I want it to say that we aren't important, that we are just trying to understand so that we can be understood. I want them to play a game that drives them in every direction that we drive ourselves so that when they finally push through all the game's influences, when they find their own meaning and solution to the puzzle of humanity, the way the game pushes you to find that for yourself, they will turn to the universe and shout as a giant alien mass, you are humanity and we love you. Behold, I am Elohim, and I speak unto the darkness. Be gone. Excess data cleared. The best game to include on the golden record would be... Pong! It's the only option that makes sense. But that answer is too easy, too straightforward, bland. The satellites didn't just include bare-bones instructions on where our sun is. What we sent were clues to our existence that we hope will be decrypted and appreciated by someone that might eventually understand our species in some small way. I think a game that could give them a unique glimpse into humanity would be Davy Readin's The Beginner's Guide. Spoilers for this game, it's like an hour and a half long and very much worth playing, so skip ahead if you haven't already. This small present to the cosmos would contain so many layers to unpack for the blissfully ignorant space dweller. Beyond the need to be literate in English and games, it is a story that deviously implies itself to be non-fiction. I just like imagining that if someone unknowingly stumbled upon this game, they might be convinced it was about a real conflict between real people. I want the aliens to be the commenters fervently convinced that Coda is not made up, and they start a small religion, or at least some subset of ideology based on the slighted game designer, and maybe eventually they conclude that he might not be historically real, but the story is still worth holding on to. Beyond that baser curiosity of mine, I think the relationship between Davy and Coda is telling about the human condition. The game uses it to explore the appropriation of art into our identities, and failing to divorce an author from the work they make, which are ideas endemic to our aesthetic culture at this point in time. Even if you disagree with the game's conclusions, it still touches on how we perceive art and interface with it as internet-connected beings. Besides that, I think the story of this supremely self-conscious character projecting their lack of motivation and stunted creativity onto somebody else is just a part of human psychology I think should be shared. This is just my bias showing, but as somewhat of a creative who is deeply self-loathing and struggles to make anything, including this less than 1000 word segment to someone else's video, I don't know, this game speaks to feelings that I have on a regular basis. What motivates a person to be? To do anything. It sometimes feels like we've lopped the top off of our hierarchy of needs and planted the need to be seen to be heard wholly in its place. We aren't all so slavishly devoted to optimizing the accrual of social currency, but it's ever-present. Humans need other people, but sometimes that necessity feels like a prison. So yeah, hopefully the beginner's guide would kind of ruin some poor alien's day. That'd be, that'd be funny. Knowledge is our pride and joy as a species. We accumulate and use our collective discoveries to push ourselves forward. And while there are a near infinite number of unknowns still left to uncover, we have made incredible progress in our time on Earth. To acquire this knowledge, we often had to take stabs in the dark. We had to form theories, test them, and analyze the results. Eventually, we coined a term for it. 
the scientific method, a fancy and premeditated way of saying trial and error. From figuring out that fire burns wood, to figuring out that fire requires oxygen, for a majority of our species history, we essentially had to take some very well-educated guesses, throw them at the wall, and see which ones stuck. For every breakthrough, there were thousands of dead ends. That process forms the bedrock of who we are, a curious species with an unquenchable thirst for knowledge beyond our limits. What better game to exemplify that than The Legend of Zelda? A game which in its purest form is about trial and error. You're given an item, the candle, but you aren't told what to do with it. There are actually many areas in which you can use this candle to burn bushes, but you're asked to figure this out yourself. You could burn everything in hopes that you'll eventually figure out what it's used for, and that will often work, just as it has for our own discoveries as a species. Perhaps, though, you can refine that method. Maybe you'll notice a few bushes that feel out of place. Maybe there's something peculiar about this bush which separates it from the others. What you've just done is formed an educated hypothesis, conducted an experiment, and formed a conclusion. You can then apply this knowledge to the rest of the adventure. As with everything, though, it isn't always the correct answer, as there are a near infinite number of variables to consider that will alter your original conclusion. Just as not all objects burn the same way, not every bush is out of the ordinary. And it's humbling, really. We may be able to make educated guesses about what is or isn't out there, but more often than not, those educated guesses are never the full truth. Because what we find through rigorous experimentation are a list of alternate questions, a set of branches leading to new hypotheses. We may have some knowledge, but it's rarely ever the full picture. We often have to amend previous truths when better conclusions are formed. For every brick wall thrown in front of us, we've been able to kick it down, then hammer it down, and then blow it up. We began as a fairly primitive species crafting spears to hunt food, and starting fires to stay warm. Now, we craft vessels to take us off our planet, we research cures for deadly diseases, and endeavor to better understand the laws of our own reality. Zelda 1 may be seen as archaic by modern standards, but that's only because it's a reflection of our past struggles. It's a reminder that we can't know everything. Sometimes we really do just have to try everything. And the satisfaction we all intrinsically feel upon discovering something new could be felt by any sentient species. Who's to say a hunger for knowledge is a uniquely human trait? Just as Zelda 1 reminds us of the long, arduous path we've taken to progress, perhaps sending it into space for other species to find will remind us that, although we often see ourselves as unique, the center of the universe, if intelligent life does exist out there, Perhaps they're more like us than we care to admit. Perhaps they'll play Zelda 1 and get the same satisfaction you'd get after burning down a bush. Tetris Effect, at first, seems like just another of the thousand different ports and variants of the most popular video game ever made. And honestly, I can't really argue with that. Ultimately, it's the same as any other version of Tetris. There are seven different kinds of blocks, or tetraminos, which are each made up of four square pieces. The goal is to arrange them at the bottom of the screen into neatly organized lines that clear from the board when formed. From a pure mechanical standpoint, the only really thing it adds is this zone mechanic that allows you to chain lines on top of one another for this extra little layer of satisfaction. Tetris, as a game, just feels inherently satisfying to play, in the same way that organizing a messy room feels satisfying. Perhaps more for some than others, it's at least somewhat in human nature to want to sort and organize things. Organization to humans is in part how we make sense of the world. We classify things all the time. Fruits and vegetables, pop and indie, left and right, good and bad. 
This sort of organization and classification is what makes things easier to understand and compartmentalize. If we didn't do that, we'd all be philosophers prying at the seemingly endless quandaries of the world, instead of clearing that metaphorical line from our brain and moving on with our lives. In a similar kind of spirit, then, let's pry. When we classify something as a video game, we do it mostly based on one thing. Interactivity is a core part of the experience. We hit play to start a movie or listen to a song, but we don't interact with it beyond that point. Therefore, it's not a video game. Of course, if we're making a movie or making a song, we are interacting with it. So does that make Logic Pro 10 a video game? It can be just as fun as a game after all. It's petty to even really give such things that degree of thought, because most people would just say, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. That is to say, if it looks like a video game, it probably is one. And because Tetris Effect is ostensibly just another version of Tetris, it also is probably just a video game. But if we're talking about the value of Tetris Effect, what it has that perhaps other forms of Tetris, or even other video games for that matter, don't have, it's because of just about everything outside of the core game. While the Tetris board sits square in the center of the screen, it blends into and evolves with its surrounding visuals, as if these visuals are the true focus of the experience. Rather than telling an explicit narrative, the visuals instead evoke a particular feeling or atmosphere. Familiar shapes like animals and landscapes will occasionally materialize, but very rarely do they evoke any particular culture or heritage. Its ambiguity forces players to draw upon their own lived experiences to complete the picture. As a result, Tetris Effect's visuals come off as more universally human. The same could be said for the music. The musical stylings here may appeal most to the Western pop audience of the modern day, but the influence is both global and historical. Pieces of songs that may be inspired by a particular culture do so respectively rather than appropriatively making it seem as though the goal, similar to the visuals, was to make all of this appear as a component of a larger, more universal whole. What makes the experience stand out most, however, is that all components dynamically affect one another, true to the game's title. The visuals inform the music, and vice versa, creating a larger sense of cohesion to the whole thing. Instead of Tetris looking and sounding like Tetris, it instead looks and sounds like whatever feeling the experience happens to elicit. Based on just this, one might conclude that actually Tetris Effect isn't much of a video game at all, because everything that makes it work has nothing to do with the interactivity. And up to a point they may be right, but the final cog that makes the whole machine click together is that the interconnectedness of the music and visuals also extends to the interactivity of the experience, to the controller you're holding. The gameplay itself affects how everything contextualizing the gameplay looks, sounds, and feels, making it feel more unique, personal, and distinctly human. While that input may not affect the visuals and music on a deep, compositional level, it does affect the experience enough to impact how that experience affects you, and because the game never tells explicit stories, it leaves a lot more room for self-insertion. And because of how simple and universal the Tetris gameplay is, the experience is surprisingly applicable across the entire emotion spectrum. It's not often one can say that an arcade game about organization made them cry, but Tetris Effect can and will, and that's due in large part to the game itself and its presentation, sure, but it also is due to whatever the player brings to the experience themselves, emotionally. Ultimately, video games are the same as anything else, they're experiences. And just like listening to a song, or watching a movie, or organizing a messy room, or watching a YouTube video, we choose to partake in these experiences because they make us feel something. Tetris Effect, more than most other experiences, is about that feeling on a primal, universal level. And isn't that really what humanity's all about? Choosing any work of art to represent humanity to the greater universe is surprisingly difficult. 
My first instinct was to go big and broad with it, both in the sense that I wanted something culturally relevant and not an obscure indie title to represent all of humanity, but also in the sense that I wanted a game that captured a wide swath of human history, something like Civilization that takes players through the various eras of mankind, or Spore which recounts the history of organisms on Earth and their growth out to the stars. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized their broad scope also makes them wildly inaccurate. Evolutionary and societal pressures are replaced with simple versions of other, better games in Spore. <laughs> and civilization flattens the complexities of human history down to a battle of rigid and eternal nation states. At best, they misrepresent our own history. At worst, they make us look like we're misinformed or just flat out liars. It also occurred to me that I probably didn't want to choose something with a win state, or at least not a formal rigid one. Win states tend to project a philosophy of a zero sum game where all things are in competition. Like civilizations, win states are already kind of weird and we as humans have the context of nation states in the present day. It would be terrifying to think that this is how humans actually thought about how life on this planet works. First one to the moon wins! This competitive approach isn't really a great way to introduce yourself to other species that might not view things that way. This was actually brought up in the movie Arrival. Well, let's say that I taught them chess instead of English. Every conversation would be a game, every idea expressed through opposition, victory, defeat, you see the problem. So win states are out. Then I thought about games that could capture the spirit of space exploration itself, like No Man's Sky or Outer Wilds. Games that are about going out into the unknown simply because it's there and learning about what we find. They have a sense of adventure and wonder about the universe, and these games don't really have a win state, per se, at least not as rigid or formal as Civilization or Spore do. No Man's Sky is famously a forever game, and Outer Wilds is more of a narrative experience than a game that you quote-unquote win. And there's no denying their ability to sell you on how much humans love discovery and learning and exploration. But they also don't really say anything about us that seeing a Voyager-style probe drifting aimlessly in space doesn't already convey? Like, the point at which you find a probe from an alien species carrying artifacts from their civilization drifting through space hoping to find somebody, you probably don't need to be told that they're into exploration and hope to find beauty, wonder, and other intelligences out there. So I scrapped those because it felt a bit redundant. So I wanted a game that didn't have win states, still conveyed that sense of exploration and adventure, but also managed to capture some essence of... humanity, I guess? Some measure of who we are. The good and the bad, the highs and the lows, the ingenuity and the idiocy, the empathy and the callousness. And God help me, I couldn't think of a better example of this than Minecraft. It meets all of my criteria. It's an impossibly popular game that has dominated global popular culture for over a decade now, so it's absolutely a relevant cultural artifact worthy of being sent up alongside Chuck Berry songs. And it's a game with no real win state, opting instead to focus on exploration and creation ad infinitum. Yeah, there's an ender dragon, but it's a pretty soft win state. In survival mode, Minecraft tries to capture the dangers of exploration, but also its rewards. The scarcity and utility of resources is what makes them precious and worth delving into a cave or reaching out into a new biome for, even if it means risking obstacles and hostilities and moving outside of a place that you've become comfortable with. The thing you need or want could just be over the next hill or around the next twist in a cave, and even if it isn't, you know more about the world you find yourself in once you've been there, which is its own reward. In creative mode, Minecraft removes scarcity outright and allows players to construct all manner of things. With enough time, players have made models of fictional cities, music boxes, calculators, and even functional replicas of theme parks. The very existence of creative mode implies a people interested in beauty, art, exploration, and connection. And that's assuming whoever finds this disc floating through space won't be able to engage with the game's collaborative multiplayer elements, which only reinforce those themes. But as much as the game highlights humanity's positive side, it also captures a lot of negative human impulses and could even be seen as maybe a warning to other species. Like, 
I'm not the first person to point out the colonial nature of Minecraft, but let's be clear, the game does emphasize arriving at a place, declaring it yours, and then consuming as many of its resources as you can as you transform it to suit your interests or needs. It's a game built on top of using violence to survive. Even if you choose to play as a vegetarian, many of the game's dangers require you to fight back, and many of the game's most important resources require you to commit violence onto other creatures to get them. And the only languages used to interact with other beings are either violence with weapons or trade, which can often be its own kind of weapon. There's no exchange of ideas in Minecraft, only the bending of other beings and even the world itself to your will. All of that wonderful art that the game lets you create involves taking a natural landscape and transforming it to fit your whims. You don't stumble onto the magic kingdom in Minecraft, you bulldoze whatever was there to build it. If Minecraft tells the story of a curious, inventive, social, and artful people, it also tells the story of a people who view the world around them as one to be consumed and subjugated. Minecraft captures how creation is fundamentally an act of destruction, and while it might show us in some ways at our best, it also tells anyone out there that to us, the universe is our canvas, and we are coming to paint. <laughs> that sounds melodramatic and cynical, and maybe it is given our current spacefaring capabilities. We're a long way from terraforming alien worlds just to build another teacup ride there. But it also feels true. More true than self-aggrandizing stories about our history and ambitions, and more meaningful than attaching a game about exploring the universe and meeting aliens on your satellite designed to explore the universe and meet aliens. Space travel gets romanticized as a noble and edifying endeavor, but the reality is it started as a race between nation-states vying for power and is now a vanity project for the ultra-wealthy. I see no reason to believe our worst tendencies won't come with us when we leave Earth. Minecraft isn't the most human story. It doesn't say anything about where we came from or what life on this blue ball was like, however briefly. But its ability to capture broad human motivations and the things we're willing to do or destroy to act on them captures something essential about our behavior that other species in the universe should probably be aware of one way or the other. As you have seen from every preceding segment, human games contain staggering diversity. Each game mentioned today has been the product of humans, each working with different backgrounds and aims, but each somehow capturing something meaningful. They all accomplish this in entirely different ways, and personally I think it's rather poetic that something as complicated as the human condition and human nature has been interpreted in such a variety of forms. For all of their differences, these games are all connected by one thing, play. I believe that play is universal. Aliens, if they exist, have likely developed play independently. Play might be universal, but at the same time, it's specific. It's a lot like food. Everyone does it, but the ways in which we do it are distinct, cultural, and personal. Play from one side of the galaxy will likely be entirely different from play on the other side. Aliens probably play games, but our games could only come from us. As shown by this collection of essays, our ludography is kaleidoscopically diversified. Each game shown draws from a distinct array of human artistic traditions and were molded by the cultures that formed them. Games don't pop out of the void free from social influence. They are socio-technical systems that draw upon culture and shape it in return. All of these games are undeniably human, and I hope by examining them we not only have found games that are worthy of alien life, but I also hope we have learned something about ourselves in the process, that through play, we can show the universe who we are. The songs aboard the Golden Record will outlive us all. Even if the Earth were to be obliterated instantaneously, the songs out there would persist. And if these games were out on a Golden Record, they too would persist. If you had the opportunity to make an expression that will not only outlive you, but your own planet, what would you say? 
what could you say? Today, you have seen several people explain their eternal proclamations to the stars, but I encourage you to consider this for yourself. Examining your favorite games under this cosmic lens, one can uncover previously unconsidered aspects. If you have made it this far in the video, I encourage you to go out there and think about this question of what game you would want aliens playing, and feel free to share it in the comments. Playing games with a consideration of an extraterrestrial audience, I counterintuitively feel this brings one into a greater understanding of humanity. At the start of this video, I said that the Golden Record was my favorite message we have sent into space, and it's my favorite because it prompts so much critical thinking about what humanity is, the art we create, and its relationship with the unknown audience. Ultimately, I doubt any human could entirely comprehend the scale of the universe. It's just too vast for anyone to truly understand. Maybe that's a good thing. Because of that enormity, we will likely not be heard. At least, not for a very, very long time. But we choose to speak to space anyway. Whether it's in the form of plaque or record, we reach out despite the silence. On a planetary scale, we have a drive to be understood, to be known, and in a way, the struggle mirrors that of everyone who has ever lived. We go through our lives trying to be understood, trying to understand ourselves, at least to some extent. We express ourselves through the art we make and share, and I guess we can all take comfort in knowing that not only is this shared between every single person, but it also reflects a struggle of our species as well. I would like to thank everyone who contributed essays for this video. Once again, here are everyone's channels in order of appearance. Lord Faust, Hot Cider, Daryl Talks Games, The Playing Field, Game Score Fanfare, Lamhoot, Transparency, Eurothug 4000, VZ Shows, Dark Fry, Retro Histories, Tectonic Improv, Mandalore Gaming, I Am Error, Tay Snickerer, Chariot Rider, David Oz, Socratetris, Zach Frazier, King K, MML's Commentaries, and Errant Signal. To everyone else, I would like to thank you for watching. It really means a lot that you would stick around for this entire video. As a final proclamation, go out there and express yourselves. Make things that give us an idea of who you are. Something like this little record we produced in 1977 that was destined for the cosmos. This has been Chariot Rider. Have a good day.